So this is the beginning of our lecture on genes and how they work. In the last lecture, we took a look at DNA and what it was, the history of DNA, how it replicates, etc. So DNA is the basic genetic code for all living things. Now, what we're going to take a look at in this lecture on genes is how we take the DNA and actually turn that into a functional expression of a trait. Blue eyes, blonde hair, heart uh, problems, blood type, etc. Those expressions are due to genes. Genes are pieces of information that sit in the DNA. So we inherited all of our genes from our parents. Half from mom, half from dad. Those combine to create the expression of your trait. So go back to genetics when we talked about did you inherit a dominant allele and a recessive allele or two recesses or two dominants, etc. That combination of alleles from mom and dad produced your DNA and then your DNA is what is going to produce the expression of your genes. So life as we know it on earth follows this pattern. Pretty much all life, we don't know of exceptions to the rule at this point. But all life follows the pattern of gene expression that we're going to take a look at here. So to get us started, we want to take a look at the history of genes and understanding how this knowledge came to be. So today we often just overlook it and just take for granted that, oh, we know this and we know that. But a lot of this information was built off of a history of scientists working on this, these ideas. And in the big picture of science, our understanding of genes and how they work is fairly limited because it's a fairly recent field. Now, Archibald Garad discovered back in 1902, he made the connection between genes and enzymes. So I'll put in that little blank there, the enzymes. So the DNA here, this contains the genetic information that produces enzymes that allow certain actions and functions and structures to be produced within the cell and that produces a function of the cell. <clears throat> now depending upon how it works you may have a negative function. This is our cell that's unhappy because its genes are not good. Something's wrong with it. The enzyme isn't working correctly. There's a problem. So Garad helped start setting a foundation back in 1902. Now, I granted, I give, you know, I understand it's 114, et cetera, years ago, which seems like forever. But you consider other fields in science. Anatomy began thousands of years ago. And there's just so much complexity to genes that we, we're we just still scratching the surface of our knowledge. So do not be surprised as we come up with new ideas and new information and new thoughts about genes and as this information changes simply because we're still learning a lot about it. Okay, so Garad was a player early on in understand, helping us understand the basics of genes and the connection to the enzymes. Now, 1941, Beetle and Tatum ran experiments where they looked at bread mold mutations. They looked at it, and you know, that stuff that causes our loaf of bread in the kitchen to go bad, that's mold. The mold mutated. It changed. And they started to identify that this nutritional mutation was linked to metabolic deficiencies in the mold. So if the mold did not have the ideal environment, the ideal bread to draw nutrients from, it had a mutation in how it would process those nutrients, that would lead to metabolic deficiency and create problems for the mold. Mold is a living organism, it's a type of fungi, it would create problems for it, and that would lead to this metabolic deficiency. So they were looking at this connection here. Metabolic deficiency, nutritional mutation, certain genes are not functioning correctly. They're trying to put the puzzle together. So what scientists have discovered is there is a central dogma of DNA. This is probably one of the core principles of genetics and molecular biology. So I'm going to put the big red star next to this here. Well, not giant red star, but the red star, and hopefully you guys you know, recognize as you see these, these are core ideas to make sure 
you remember, make sure you copy down, make sure you recognize the importance. So the central dogma of D oh, central dogma of DNA tells us how this process of gene expression works. The information will only flow from DNA to RNA to then the proteins. All right, that's it. That's how it works. That's what we understand when we're looking at DNA in living things. So my body, your body, your dog, if you have fish in a fish tank, the grass outside in your yard, the bacteria that are inhabiting our world, etc. It all flows in the same pattern. DNA to RNA to become a protein. Now transcription is the step that takes the DNA and turns it into RNA. That's going to be that key step there. So that first arrow in that little central dogma line there, that first arrow represents transcription. DNA gets turned into RNA. So right here is transcription. The second arrow over here, this is translation. This is when RNA becomes a protein. We use RNA information to code for the protein structure during translation. We're going to go through this. We're going to walk through the process, make sure everybody feels comfortable with it. But this is a core, core concept for this entire unit and for you guys as biologists. Make sure you remember this core concept. What did mess up a lot of scientists for years and years and years were viruses. We assumed everything had DNA information in it. And that was it. That was the standard. DNA in everything. But we've discovered viruses that contain RNA. These are known as retroviruses. So the retrovirus comes into the picture carrying RNA information. That's this guy right here. A little retro hairdo and big shades. That retrovirus is going to come into the picture with RNA that then gets turned into DNA, then back to RNA, then to the protein. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. You'll get into retroviruses more with uh, um, Bio 112 when you cover bacteria and viruses. But the main one to think about, this little thing right here, that's the HIV virus. That comes into your body as a retrovirus. It has an RNA code that then goes and gets turned into DNA, then back to RNA, then to the protein. Okay, so very, very standardized pattern um, that we see across all living things. And we even see this among non-living, i.e. the viruses. So, okay, so here's kind of the overview picture of it. Here's our nucleus. There's our DNA. Here's a bacterial cell. There's its DNA, or prokaryote. The DNA strand opens up, and one side of it, only one side of it, will be used as a template for this central dogma. Here's a C, T, T, C, T, A, G, etc. on the DNA strand. Transcription turns these letters into messenger RNA information. Now I want you guys to make sure you're coding this and you're understanding how the coding process works. C here becomes a G there. T becomes A. T becomes A. C becomes G. T becomes A. A in the DNA strand becomes a U down here in the RNA strand. Huge difference. Huge thing to keep in mind. This is a little bit different than if we were replicating our DNA like we did in the last lecture. When we go from DNA to RNA, A codes for U, codes for uracil. That is a key thing to remember. If we have a G up here, it codes for a C or a cytosine in the messenger RNA strand here. Now that strand then goes through translation and turns into a protein creates an amino acid chain, or we call it a polypeptide chain, and it creates a protein structure that expresses your physical trait. Okay, So it could be your eye color, your hair color, your blood type, etc., but your traits are expressed based on that protein structure. 
Okay, so that's kind of the overview. We're going to walk through step at a time, make sure you guys feel comfortable with this and how this process works. So, all right, so here's transcription. DNA acts as a template. So the blue line here, the red line down here, that's your DNA strand. Now, which side is used as a template today? That varies. Today, this may be the side used, and that's why you have brown hair. Later in life, as we get older, it may replicate or use this piece down here. And, oh, now your hair is turning gray. So only one piece of the DNA strand is going to be used, and that section that's being used expresses your trait. Traits change throughout our lives. That's just the normal part of our life. We will get older, we will get gray, we will have wrinkles, things change in us. And it's not because it's new DNA being introduced into the body. It's not, boof, here's brand new DNA that you just got. It's because different pieces of your existing DNA are being read. So if a genetic disorder expresses later in life, like the example of Huntington's shows up in your 30s. That's because that part of the chromosome was not being used until you reached that point of your life. So it gives us hope with genetic engineering that maybe we can figure out how to stop that part of the chromosome from being read, and maybe that will prevent the expression of that genetic disorder. So Biotechnology. We'll get into that later in additional lectures. For now, let's focus on, let me get back to here and focus on what's going on with transcription. DNA acts as a template, and the coding works. If there's a G here, we got a C in the RNA strand. An A becomes a U in the RNA strand. A T becomes an A. A C becomes a G. And this will continue this transcription all down the length of the DNA strand until it says we got all the information that we need. Okay, So transcription is taking DNA, turning it into messenger RNA. Now translation is going to be when the ribosome, this is our protein factory, when the ribosome codes messenger RNA into an amino acid sequence. And the way this is going to work, the ribosome is going to read this chunk of the messenger RNA. And it always does it in three-letter blocks. So let me put a little note here. This is a key thing to remember. Three-letter block is called a codon. Okay, so the codon is going to be three messenger RNA letters, or let's get rid of letters and call it bases. Three messenger RNA bases. Okay, so these first three bases, UCG, represent a specific amino acid. This is called serine. That's a specific amino acid here. The next three, CGA, represent a specific amino acid called arginine. And then we have asperitate and tyrosine and so on. And I'll show you the chart, how this works. I'm not going to ask you guys to be able to do this from your memory. I want you to understand the process. The charts are always available. So you don't have to memorize the chart and what group of information here, what codon equals what amino acid. That's, that's not something that's worth spending time trying to memorize. It's crazy volume of information, but understanding how to use it is the key that I want you guys to be able to do. So again, translation is when the ribosome codes the messenger RNA into the amino acid sequence. It's a key thing that it's going to do here during translation. Okay, now to translate, that ribosome requires a big team, team of helpers. It's got messenger RNA, it has ribosomal RNA, transfer RNA, small nuclear RNA, all these different players, and these are all enzymes. All these different structures are going to be involved helping the ribosome. So there's the big purple ribosome that reads the code, and then all these other little RNAs help it. They work together as a team to try to ensure the code is translated correctly. Okay, so what we'll look at in our next lecture here is the genetic code and what Francis Crick and 
Sidney Brenner discovered about DNA and the amino acid order.